Good evening and welcome to the launch of the book, India's National Security Challenges, edited by Mr. N. N. Bora. We all know our speakers this evening, but it is customary to give a brief introduction. Mr. Vora is Life trust Trustee and past President of the IIC. He is a retired 1959 batch Indian Administrative Service Officer of Punjab Kader, who was the 12th Governor of Jammu and Kashmir. As an IAS officer, Mr. Vora has also served as Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister of India, Home Secretary of India, Defence Secretary of India, and Defence Production Secretary of India. He was conferred India's second highest civilian honor, the Padma Vibhushan, for his contributions to the civil services in 2007. Ambassador Shiv Shankar Menon is a former National Security Advisor, Government of India, and former Foreign Secretary of India. He is presently Distinguished Fellow at CSEP and a visiting professor at Ashoka University. Ambassador Menon's long career in public service spans diplomacy, national security, atomic energy, disarmament policy, and India's relations with its neighbors and major global powers. He was also a distinguished fellow with Brookings India. He is the author of Choices Inside the Making of India's Foreign Policy, published by the Brookings Press and Penguin Random House in 2016, and India and Asian Geopolitics, The Past, Present, published by Penguin in 2021. Ambassador Menon was also a member of India's Atomic Energy Commission. I would like first to invite the chair, Mr. Sham Saran, Life Trustee and President IIC, to make his opening remarks. Uh, good evening, all of you and a uh, very warm welcome uh, to this uh, evening's uh, session. Uh, a very special uh, occasion uh, for the India International Center. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Vora, former president of the India International Center, and uh, Mr. Vora, who has also edited this very fine uh, book on India's national security uh, challenges. I will, of course, uh, invite him later to introduce uh, this uh, edited book. Uh, and my friend and colleague, uh, Shiv Shankar Menon, uh, who has very kindly consented uh, to deliver the keynote uh, address uh, this evening. Uh, friends, um, I don't think we can uh, find uh, a person who would be uh, as perhaps familiar with India's national security challenges than perhaps the two persons who are sitting here uh, on the dais. Uh, one, as you have heard, has uh, served in virtually every important uh, you know, uh, uh, part of the government of India dealing with security, uh, whether it is defense or whether it is uh, the internal security uh, you know, uh, area. Uh, and uh, you know his his, his uh, vast expanse uh, of experience uh, is something which is uh, you know uh, unmatched. Uh, he was also someone who, after the uh, Kargil Committee uh, review, uh, when it was decided to really work out what are the ways in which we could uh, deal with some of the major security challenges that India faced, uh, was uh, also uh, you know, responsible for the uh, task force that uh, really looked at this uh, whole issue. Uh, Shiv Shankar Menon, of course, uh, has been uh, a foreign service officer, a person who has served as foreign secretary, but very importantly served as India's national security advisor uh, for five years, uh, during which uh, very major reforms uh, were made uh, in India's national security structure system. Uh, of course, characteristically, um, Shankar is not somebody who would broadcast all the things that he did. Uh, but uh, really, uh, I can tell you that uh, that was a time where some very important uh, you know, changes were made in India's national security system. And those have actually stood us uh, very well. Uh, I recall, for example, that it was uh, thanks to him, um, especially when he, after he became Foreign Secretary and then National Security Advisor, that uh, we uh, conducted uh, some very, very detailed uh, border infrastructure surveys. Uh, 
uh, which enabled us, in fact, to really improve border infrastructure, which, of course, uh, the present political dispensation has expanded. But uh, the real start to much of that was, was uh, thanks to the support given uh, by uh, Shankar Menon. Uh, so this is a, <coughs> a very uh, you know, important occasion for us because in this book, uh, we have contributions with, from some of the uh, very key players in the national security field. Uh, people who are from the academic side, people who are from the media, uh, people who are from the defense side, from the military side, uh, as well as people who have also a foreign service uh, background. So you will see from the range of essays which are there, uh, which virtually every aspect of India's national security challenges have been uh, covered and very constructive in the sense that uh, not only pointing out what may be the gaps that are there in the uh, national security uh, system, but what are the ways in which we can address them in an environment today which is transforming virtually every day, changing virtually every day. Uh, the kind of uh, challenges which we are facing are, you know, um, they are, their manifestations are changing every day. Uh, so uh, it is really very opportune to have something uh, like this book available to us uh, today uh, for, uh, for all of you to uh, really uh, appreciate what, uh, what the challenges are and what are some of the ways that we can meet. I would uh, particularly recommend that you read the introductory uh, chapter which has been uh, penned by Mr. Vora himself because I think it gives you a bro very broad sweep of what the, what the challenges uh, are. So uh, with those uh, opening remarks, let me once again welcome all of you. Welcome uh, Mr. Vora, welcome uh, Mr. Menon uh, to this session. I, I'm sure that this will be a very stimulating session for all of us. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to ask Ambassador Shiv Shankar Menon to formally release the volume. We'll now hear from Mr. Vora about this very important, timely, and topical publication that shows the way to a holistic national security policy. I will add that I have had the privilege, perhaps, to be one of the first people to have read the manuscript because I worked on it with Mr. Vora and the contributor, so it's really an honor, sir. Mr. Vora. President Shamsaran. Ambassador Shivshankar Menon, I can call him an old and young friend. We worked together on many occasions in the decades gone by. Ladies and gentlemen, Sham, thank you very much for the very gracious remarks. <clears throat> uh, in the next few minutes, I will very quickly try to go over some of the, the more pressing concerns that we have had in the past months, past years. And to begin with, I would say that the, this institution, the IIC, has been almost ever since its inception concerned with the debating, discussing, disseminating information enlarging awareness about issues of uh, seminal national concern as well as international concern. And in that process over the past more than 60 years uh, that we have been in existence, we've had any number of occasions when uh, national security was, has been discussed. As per the perceptions uh, which obtained at the particular points of time in the years gone by. So in uh, 2020, uh, which was the height of COVID, COVID had come back in 20, 
we thought had gone away. Uh, the, the government announced the appointment of the chief of defense staff, which was, had been discussed and debated for almost three decades. In my time in the defense ministry, I was there for eight, nine years, and much before me, this has been a subject of debate and discussion. And about the same time, not simultaneously, but about the same time, we had uh, problems on the LSC, uh, the PLA Army, China getting a little aggressive, trying to assert itself. And uh, of course, needless to say, Pakistan is always active on our Western uh, borders in sabotage, subversion, radicalism, besides carrying out the proxy war in, in Kashmir. As national security is a term or two words, a terminology which, which is used uh, uh, quite unthinkingly sometimes. It has enormous implications, crucial, vital significance, and it is not uh, simple or so easy to, to say that we will meet together for two, three days uh, and discuss national security. So we tried to, to limit it to, to two basic concerns. One was naturally to ask this question, what is the national policy on national security? And associated with this question, what is the delineation of responsibilities, role and responsibilities as between the center and the states in terms of national security management? And the second main theme was to, to uh, debate issues of higher defense management which were surfacing, which had been raised uh, quite aggressively after the announcement of the appointment of CDS. And surprisingly, but uh, not so ironically, uh, most of the issues which had surfaced uh, were not raised by uh, political echelons, were not raised by retired civilians. Uh, they were raised uh, very uh, sharply by retired military generals and uh, veterans. So we thought that we will uh, focus on higher defense management as uh, the second element of national security management, national security policy. <clears throat> now at that time there were physical problems, uh, COVID, uh, calling people over, and where to seat them and to keep two seats vacant and have masks and so on and so forth. So we, we decided to have webinars, online discussions, which in the beginning were technically problematic, but as we went along, uh, things smoothened out and we had very successful discussions lasting for hours and hours without any interruption. Now to, to elicit opinion, comment, criticism, informed uh, opinion, if I may say so, uh, we consciously took a decision that this time around we would uh, uh, not have so many academics and uh, journalists and strategic analysts and writers, but have a majority of veterans, practitioners, who have spent their entire lives in uniform. Let them come and tell us what has gone wrong and why and what needs to be done about it. So we had two, two chiefs, one ex-naval chief, one air chief, one very eminent uh, Northern Army commander who, who and I worked together for over five years. One equally well-known corps commander, one uh, air warrior who was also a military historian, Arjun Subramaniam. Uh, we had uh, Commodore Bhaskar, who was not only a member, he's a, a former director general of the IDSC. And of course, we started with, uh, not with these gentlemen I mentioned, but with uh, the director general <coughs> of IDSC, which is the most uh, eminent and the oldest think tank that we have in Delhi, Ambassador Shinoy. Now, the discussions that we had uh, were very open, very frank, 
needless to say, you, you can't tell retired admiral, retired air chief, uh, what kind of sentences to utter and what kind of uh, language to use when he expresses himself. They use hard language at times, and, but they said what they had to say. And uh, in no uncertain terms. But uh, these remarks, these observations had to be taken note of for the specific reason that these uh, observations came from, these opinions were uttered by people who had done nothing in their lives except uh, uh, render service to the country on the frontier, in unknown places, on the high seas, in the air, in submarines, and wherever else. So the, these are round of discussions that we had uh, during the COVID period. Uh, they were extremely useful. By the time we were closing, our government uh, allowed us to lift the barriers. Uh, the district magistrate, the chief secretary, Delhi, we were guided by their directions. They, they allowed us to have limited uh, uh, meetings, limited uh, get-togethers by adhering to the uh, disciplinary regulations that we were people not sitting close to each other, etc., etc., wearing masks and so on. At that time, I, I had been after the then CDS, uh, General Bipin Rawat, whom I had known very well. He served as a divisional commander in Baramula for two years on the Uri frontier. And I had been after him, chasing him, but he was busy, genuinely busy. And B, he was somewhat apprehensive that if he came on any platform, even our platform, which is not a very unwholesome platform, um, he may say something or something, something may be misinterpreted and he would get into avoidable trouble. But at the end of the uh, day he accepted my request, he came and he spoke at some length. He answered all the questions that I asked. I had given him a list that I would be asking you these questions so that he didn't have to do. Uh, he bothered at the last minute. So this went on and uh, with, with that we brought the series to an end. So I would uh, particularly like to thank all, all our uh, uh, military veteran participants, the retired generals and air marshals who uh, participated at our request, and particularly to General Rawat, I uh, remember him and pay tribute to him. He uh, lost his life in a tragic accident before his term could come to an end. Now, coming to the book, I, I, how the book was made now, Omita has introduced the subject, introduced all of us. She's our chief editor, we have a chief program officer, and we have our director, Kailash Srivastava. All three of them were very helpful to enable me to put the manuscript together, to weed out what seemed inessential, to, to uh, do the essential editing, and to, to present the book. So my thanks to all of them. Uh, my thanks are also due to the publishers, uh, whom I think we bother a little more than normally the case, Primus. And I'm particularly, uh, I would particularly like to mention that while errors do take place, typographical, grammatical, and others, in any book which is uh, brought out, ours is a very small 115 pages, 16 pages, uh, not much scope. But there is one error which I would not term as an error. I think it psychologically suggests that even our publisher has got affected by this theme of the book. He calls the NDA government the National Defense Academy government. <laughs> My apology for that, but I said that psychologically, I think it uh, speaks, uh, speaks a great deal about Now, I, I don't have to, uh, we invited uh, Ambassador Menon to former Foreign Secretary, former NSA, long experience within and outside the country. And uh, he would be giving us his very considered comments and views on what national security is all about and what we should be doing. But I would merely say uh, briefly that uh, it is my conviction, it is almost uh, 
Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in, uh, I cannot but keep on repeating myself that national security, safeguarding national security is of the most crucial importance in the Indian context. We are a large country with large population, unlimited diversity of languages, religions, castes, colors, creeds, food habits, clothing habits, hairstyles. And um, even if nothing else happens, no external intrusion or no internal disturbance, we are prone uh, to have some tensions, some con conflicts, some confrontations. And if we are aided by adversary inimical agencies, then of course we have uh, a, lot, a lot of stuff on our plate. So therefore, internal security and external security, both are two main columns, but around them there are a whole of other security, food security, environment security, climate change security, and all that. It's no longer a question of physical securities, that you have infantry battalions and with rifles, your soldiers with bayonets will go and come out of the pickets and march against the enemy and kill them. That is not the scenario now. So besides the, the diversity and the largeness and the, 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 the pigment situations we face from time to time, we have had disturbances, internal disturbances, significant in the Northeast, uh, the Naxalism, the left-wing extremism. We've had, um, thanks to Pakistan and other friends, terrorism, which has uh, become now a uh, fact of life 24-7. Uh, a uh, process of uh, the phenomena of radicalization, again, has settled down. It's become a permanent phenomenon, and, uh, and not only peculiar to our region or to our country or to uh, our theater, but it goes far beyond. And then um, if you don't talk about food and shelter and water and climate and other things, you have external security, which is, uh, in our case, we have known enemies, known adversaries, both on the northern frontier and on the eastern frontier, not very friendly people. Um, and then we have, of course, unknown enemies, unknown adversaries. By that I mean the, 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 the wars of the future are no longer the kind of legacy syndrome that we have, how wars were fought in the past and how future wars will be fought. It's no longer true. Uh, you have now um, cyber, space, high technology, artificial intelligence, you know, robotics, what have you. There's a whole range of uh, threats which are uh, floating around uh, for which we have to safeguard. Uh, our physical security and our national security. And uh, let me say in passing, which is not so much in passing, that in our case, nas without national security, we will have no economic development, no growth. And it's a vicious circle. If we have no growth, we will have very limited national security. Because security is a very costly business. So it's, it's a cyclical thing. We need to be very conscious of what we need to do, uh, how we need to do, and in what kind of time frame. So I, I'm running out of time. So I, I would go further and say that uh, um, we need to be ever prepared for all manner of threats. Now that's a tall order. You can't even list the number of threats you face and to say to be ever prepared, because you need to deter. You need to deter your potential enemies from uh, getting funny with you. And uh, if they do that, then you need to be powerful enough, well organized enough to defeat your enemy. So therefore, I would say that you need a pragmatic, a holistic, cohesive, inclusive, national security policy. Now, our friends in the services are more prone to use the word doctrine. They talk about where is your national doctrine, where is your defense doctrine, where is your internal security doctrine, and so on. But my own perception is that you have a policy framework, and once the policy framework, which is internal security, external security, our foreign policy, our defense policy, our economic policy, 
and so on, uh, the doctrines will flow from those perceptions, those understandings. And these uh, doctrines shall have to be, uh, again, holistic. They will have to be internal security, and external security means the military uh, doctrines. And military doctrines are not just simple pieces of paper. In today's uh, situation, military doctrines are a very, very big challenge. So on one side, if you talk of internal security, you have a horde of uh, challenges before you, public order, law and order, no internal disturbances, no communal writing, no, no this, no that. But putting that aside for the moment, I would say that uh, if you come to the military uh, sector, the military segment, the uniform segment, particularly the defense services, then uh, there are large issues. What kind of uh, defense services, military services you want to have? What is the scale? What should be they capable of doing in the times to come, in the current kind, uh, context and in the, uh, in the emerging context? What kind of capabilities you want to imbue your military services with? And we've gone through all this kind of debate for years and years, and we have also agreed not very long ago that uh, especially after the first CDS was appointed, that the first challenge before the first CDS was, and also before the current CDS, um, how to bring the three services to, together, to think together, to plan operations together, and to f fight a war together. Now, fighting a war together is a uh, tall order. Each of our three services have been historically have historically grown on their own path, uh, virtually independent. And uh, when they cooperate with each other, which they sometimes do, as they did in 1971, that's an exception. Otherwise, they're very individualistic. And they have separate doctrines. Army has its own doctrine. And within the army, there are also issues of so many combat arms and supporting arms and so on. So this question of jointness of collectivity or integrating as the word is used that the CDS will be a person, four star, five star, whatever you have, he will bring the three services into a frame of mind and drill them into a situation where they can deliver the punch collectively and knock out the adversary. Now, that collectivity is easy to talk about. It's not easy to bring about. It requires a whole deal of effort. And I would say that we need much greater understanding of military matters at the political level, at the bureaucratic level. We need not only much greater understanding, particularly at the political level in operational terms, but we also need to strengthen our support systems. The entire infrastructure, administrative infrastructure, organization infrastructure, which supports the functioning of the defense forces, the military, needs to be in harmony with the requirements of the unity of purpose. When we say their jointness, that jointness then assumes and presumes that there will be no impediment, no huddle, no irritant in the path of the services delivering their goal uh, when they want to go about it. So we need uh, integration at the level of uh, the services. We need integration and harmony and understanding at the level, political military level, between the political masters and the military leaders, between the political masters, military leaders, and the bureaucracy. So they, 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 we can't afford to have any irritant of any kind if, if we uh, want to fight future wars. We need to build up a joint uh, war, joint war fighting doctrine, which is again a tall order, not easy. Uh, we got lost in theaterization and so on and so forth. The debate got somewhat debased because uh, we have to go step by step, lay the bricks, brick by brick, uh, you cannot uh, talk of jointness or collectivity, integration, uh, merely by uh, 
uh, authorizing the commanding generals to punish uh, officers of all three services. Uh, that's a good thing to do when you are uh, commander of the one service. You cannot have a situation when officers of other two services uh, uh, do not obey orders instantly as they must. So we need to do all kinds of things. Now, before closing, I just say, uh, shave one matter which, which I will come back to you again, is when we have done all our good work and our homework and drawn up some kind of uh, reasonable paper of how we are going to go about it, um, you need civil services, public services, bureaucrats, to do the support work as we need in Home Ministry, as we need in the Defense Ministry, I worked in both, as we need in any other ministry which is concerned with the national security, and as I said earlier, there's hardly any ministry which is now not concerned with national security, whether it's water resources or agriculture or food and so on and so forth. So what are the kind of people who will support the functioning of Ministry of Defense or Home or the Intelligence Bureau or the external agencies, external intelligence and so on, and the uh, multitude, uh, the, the, the large array of institutions which have come up and more of, of such will require to come up if you want to build a strong national security superstructure. Uh, my uh, focus is on the bodies, the you call under secretaries, deputy secretaries, joint secretaries, defense secretaries and so on. I have been of the view when Cargill Committee had accepted my view but it got lost, as most things get lost, that you need to pick up volunteers who are willing, who are keen, give them specialized training, then deploy them in Defense Ministry, Home Ministry, Intelligence Bureau, RAW, et and so forth. And now that happened in uh, 2000. My report was discussed by a group of ministers headed by Mr. Dwani, Deputy Prime Minister, then um, Foreign Minister, Finance Minister, External Affairs Minister, Defense Minister, four other ministers. Now 23 years have passed. The scenario is far more complicated, far more complex, far more threatening. And I have said in my preface to this book in the first chapter that perhaps time has come for the government to be bold and to, to create, establish National Security Administration Service which will not only service the various security-related uh, organizations, units, agencies, but also all security-related organizations in the states located all across the country. And that brings me to my last point, that there is apparent, visible lack of understanding center state understanding in matters of national security. States have not been taken into adequate con confidence. And when a crisis develops, some emergency takes place, then they are given instructions of what to do, what kind of mobilizations to be done. That's not good enough. We are a very large country, and as I said, very populous, very diverse. States have to be taken into confidence, and I trust that the national security policy will, among many other things, delineate the contours of this collaboration, this coordination, and this working together. Collectivity is not only between Army, Navy, and Air Force, collectivity between the states and the Union. So thank you very much. I've overstepped my time. My uh, apologies, uh, Sham. And to Shankar. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I now invite our speaker, our key note address, Ambassador Shiv Shankar Man. Shri Enen Bora, Shri Sham Saran, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and friends. Those are not exclusive categories, by the way. Uh, thank you for asking me to speak to you today at the launch of this important book on India's national security challenges, edited by Shivora. The, the book is actually proof that significance is not a function of size or weight. It looks like a small book, but it's actually a very important book. Uh, 
I must confess that I'm a little intimidated to speak at the release of a volume that Mr. Vora has not only edited but also contributed to. Uh, he has been, well, an inspiration, a mentor, a guide to so many of us in the civil service. And he taught us, by example, what a civil servant should be by showing us professionalism, apolitical commitment, and selfless dedication. Uh, thank you for that example. We really need it. Uh, I thought I'd say a few words today about the themes of the book and then make a few comments occasioned by those themes. The book itself is interesting because it doesn't make the mistake that many books on national security do, which is just to list all the threats and then to give you a list of solutions based on today's buzzwords and what's fashionable, which pretty soon goes out of date and frankly uh, is always overtaken by events. Instead, what it does is it deals with fundamental issues uh, of national security, of defense management actually, and which have long-term strategic impact. And let me try and mention some of these. Uh, Mr. Vora sets the tone in the introduction with a very cogent and persuasive piece on the pressing need for a national security policy with MOD, MHA, working in separate silos. Today he ri rightly argues that we lack the kind of holistic approach that a national security policy would give us. And in the absence of an NSP, we end up with ad hoc decisions on issues. Now there have been at least three attempts that I know of uh, in the past to produce a national security strategy. I and mean, ultimately I think what we're talking about is, is the same thing here. And in each case, the hesitation came not from the professionals, but from the political levels. I sense, and, but cannot prove, that uh, they do not wish their hands to be tied. Uh, and since, because strategy is ultimately an ends and means problem. And if you agree on the ends in a national strategy, then you have to provide the means. Uh, and that there is, I sense, that's where the resistance comes from. How to overcome this, I really don't know, because there seems to be consensus across the board that we need such a national document which brings thinking together. Uh, and also the big advantage of such a document, a national security policy or strategy, is that it would introduce an element of accountability into the management of defense which I think everybody in this book, at least, all the authors seem to agree on. Uh, there is also a fundamental issue discussed in the book about, on the conception of the CDS's role and the degree to which it is operational or advisory. Uh, different points of view are expressed in the book. Uh, and. Uh, Luckily, we don't fall into the trap of just saying what other countries did and therefore we have to do the same. There's a really serious discussion of this. But we still need to find our own way on this issue. Today, if you look at the CDS's charter, uh, he is the principal military advisor, uh, which rather like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs in the US, for instance, uh, He's also the equivalent of the Secretary of the Department of Military Affairs, of the DMA. Uh, and he's also supposed to drive military reform and defense reform. Uh, and what is unclear is, frankly, his operational role. And that's something that I think we do need much more clarity in our own thinking. There is also a larger issue here which of the multiple institutions that we have created over time and their relationship with each other. Uh, you know, it's been 25 years almost since we were the first parliamentary democracy to set up a National Security Council. So what exactly, how does the NSC, the NSC Secretariat, the NSA, how do they relate operationally in the command and control chain to the rest of the structures that we have now created. Uh, I say this because a clear chain of command is essential if we are to respond to the security situation that faces us. 
And frankly, uncertainty in this respect affects our ability to deter our adversaries. Uh, so my own sense is that while a full-fledged national security policy may be difficult at this time, it is time for a white paper on defense that makes clear government's thinking on these issues and the path forward. Not surprisingly, jointness is, is the one subject that was universally supported, but each one seems to have their own idea of what it means. And jointness, not just between the services, but with, with the services and civilians, also the integration of the political level in our present arrangement. And there's general dissatisfaction among the authors with the present arrangements. Uh, uh, there is, the first CDS was very committed to introducing jointness and in the working of the services, and in fact in the creation of theater commands as well. Uh, but we hear much less about this today. Uh, theaterization itself was probably one of the most uh, contentious of the topics discussed. It's also something that's essential if we are to prevail over adversaries. Uh, I, it's interesting when you look at the other countries that have introduced jointness and theaterization. In no country that I can think of or that I know of have jointness and theaterization come about by consensus among all the stakeholders, particularly among those in uniform. Uh, whether it was 1986, Goldwater Nichols in the US, reform in the UK, military system, or the, even the 2015 PLA reforms, uh, which drew on US models, uh, reform was widely recognized as needed but its shape was finally decided and enforced by a decisive political leadership. Uh, in each case, there was resistance, there was considerable pushback, uh, but the results in terms of effectiveness far outweighed the unforeseen and negative consequences. And frankly, we can argue about jointness, theaterization till kingdom comes, but ultimately, what it needs is a political decision at the very top, if we are to, and frankly, it's an essential one. Uh, the book also makes clear that there are differences of opinion uh, between civilian and service attitudes to the role of the Ministry of Defense and the new Department of Military Affairs. Uh, there's a common plea throughout the book, running through the book, for accountability and professionalism in the running, the manning, and the op operation of these national security institutions. Uh, there are some broader issues also raised here. General Rawat, in his contribution, argues that in an era of total war, we need the involvement of the entire society in our national defense. Now, this is unexceptional as a, as a sentiment. But it does raise a lar larger question, whether the answer is to militarize society or civilianized, civilianize the military. Uh, Europe has probably gone too far in one direction. Israel may be in the other direction. Uh, and militarizing society produces a society on tenterhooks. Uh, prone to violence and doesn't necessarily produce security as we see in the Levant today. Uh, the, the quest for absolute security by one actor uh, creates insecurity for most of the others. The, so the question really is how do you strike a balance between these two? Uh, because civilianizing the military opens them to politicization reduces their military efficacy. Uh, how do you find a balance which respects humanitarian law, the laws of war, and ensures deterrence and the capability to prevail when deterrence fails? One thing I would have liked more of in the book is a detailed discussion that Mr. Vora just mentioned about internal security's relationship to national defense. Uh, Ajay Sani has an excellent chapter, actually, in the book 
uh, on the effects of growing inequality, on the erosion of the integrity and autonomy of state institutions and of other recent phenomena. And frankly, the spread of lawlessness and fraught center-state relations, which Mr. Vora just mentioned, these mean that internal security increasingly impinges on our national defense. Uh, Mr. Vora makes some very pointed suggestions in the book based on his vast experience for MHA to be relieved of, of most non-security related tasks and uh, to be redesigned as a Ministry of Internal Security Affairs and manned by trained personnel, as he just mentioned. Uh, I, there has been a progressive increase in internal security threats and, but maybe this is the subject of the next volume that we can expect, I hope, without COVID. But, uh, because actually that distinction between internal security, external security is being blurred by porous borders, by cyberspace, by increasing economic dependencies. And siloed thinking may, means that we are no longer capable of dealing with it. Uh, so I cannot stress too strongly the need for us to take heed of what this book says and to act rapidly on these issues of national defense management. I say so for three larger reasons. One is that although India doesn't face an existential threat from abroad, the external situation has worsened considerably in the last decade and a half. The task of Indian national security professionals is to create an enabling environment for India's transformation into a modern, prosperous, and secure country where every Indian has the opportunity to really realize their potential. And that requires us to continue to deter our adversaries in order to avoid war as far as possible and where that proves not possible, to at least increase the intervals between wars. While we've achieved that for several decades, the task of deterring our adversaries has now got harder with a slowing world economy, with rising great power rivalry, and with developments in technology. Uh, technology has changed and expanded the battlefield and nullified some of our advantages as we saw on the LAC. Uh, great power rivalry enables Pakistan to charge strategic rent again, which she couldn't do for some years in between. Uh, and when our economy is more than ever before integrated into the world economy, there will be less available for the self-strengthening, for military modernization and defense reform that we all agree is essential. Secondly, deterrence has broken down along the LAC with China which is our major security preoccupation. What happened in 2020 in the Western sector and subsequent developments, including local disengagement in some areas, is evident to all in satellite pictures, which the public can access very easily. These do not suggest that deterrence has been reestablished or restored. Indeed, we're in a political impasse and a military standoff with over 100,000 troops strung out along the LAC in the Western sector, and infrastructure construction continuing apace. Uh, so the LAC is live. There is nothing to suggest that we are making progress towards either stabilizing the border with China or preventing China from using the threat of action on the border. The commitment of scarce resources to the standoff itself rep represents an opportunity cost for our national defense, and it also poses serious reputational damage to us internationally. Thirdly, reform half done creates new vulnerabilities without resolving old ones. You cannot cross a chasm by two leaps in two leaps. Uh, we are today in a situation where many of the reforms begun by, by the former CDS, by General Rawat, who has a very well-argued contribution in the volume, by the way, those reforms are still incomplete. Uh, besides, we, as I said, operational roles need to be clear at every level, from the NSA, CDS downwards, 
Besides, the issues which we have treated as internal to us, say Agnivir, for instance, they have external ramifications. We've seen the effects on what happens in our relationship with Nepal, and they still need to, to be dealt with. Other issues are still pending from the past. Uh, the fate of the Mountain Strike Corps, which has fluctuated, for instance, uh, and was approved by the CCS in 2013, is one such example, the limbo in which the NDU is. I mean, there's a whole host of issues. Air, uh, you know, the integration of combat air with the army. Uh, but the common thread through all these three reasons that I mentioned for uh, change and for quick change is the need to enhance our ability to deter our potential adversaries. If their assertive behavior is anything to go by, that deterrence has been eroded and its credibility needs to be restored. And that's why reform of our defense management and armed forces is so essential. What has happened between Israel and Hamas since October 7th is an object lesson on how dangerous complacency and hubris can be and how devastating the consequences are. We also see in the Levant how hard it is to restore deterrence once it is degraded and how military options can only go so far in, without a clear political goal and component in the state's response to terrorist and other attacks and threats. There are clearly lessons for us to be learned from what is happening in the Levant. In other words, our overall goal of transforming India remains and will need to be defended in new ways in the future. The book offers us pathways forward to do so. Indeed, though I have spoken of differences of opinion expressed in the book, I was impressed by the extent to which the authors from different services with varied experiences actually agree on what needs to be done. And that's why I will end by thanking Mr. Vora and the authors for this contribution to raising the level of discussion on India's defense management. It's an honest work by some of the best national security professionals in the country. I do hope that it will start a real debate and lead to action. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Shankar, for a very magisterial survey of our national security uh, challenges, building upon the excellent contributions that have been made in this book. Um, let, me, let me just uh, uh, point out that uh, uh, perhaps we need a similar kind of book, sir, for the nuclear side, because I think that is one dimension of national security, which perhaps uh, uh, that is a name that should not be spoken, but I think it needs to be uh, also uh, looked at. So that is one uh, aspect that I think uh, is, is perhaps uh, lacking here. The uh, second point uh, that I would like to make is uh, that you mentioned, for example, that uh, three attempts have been made uh, to come up with a national security strategy. Um, may I also recall, therefore, that in 2015, we actually produced a national security uh, strategy after nearly two years of uh, work, um, a 40-page uh, document. And many of the things that have been talked about here, uh, sir, about um, the comprehensive nature of security challenges, that there are internal security challenges, there are external security challenges, environmental, climate change as a challenge, economic security as a challenge. Um, information, the role of information in terms of you know, how do we manage national security. All these aspects were actually dealt with in that, uh, in that uh, document. Um, and even to some extent, uh, you know, nuclear security. Um, but uh, as uh, Shankar has pointed out, I think the problem has always been that we have not been able to persuade successive political leaderships uh, to actually, uh, you know, adopt uh, such kind of a strategy uh, document. And the reason seems to be that, uh, at least at the political level, uh, it is much more comfortable to have all options open all the time. Uh, and, and you actually end up by having 
soon uh, not many options left. Uh, so uh, I think this is uh, something where uh, really a lot of work needs to be done. That you know having options open all the time is really not, uh, not really conducive to any kind of national security uh, planning. Uh, the other point uh, that I would uh, uh, like to uh, make is that with uh, respect to um, the kind of national security challenges that we face today, they are very complex. India itself has become very complex. The you know, international environment in which we operate has also become much more complex. And it is changing all the time. So when you have so many moving parts, both internally as well as externally, it is impossible for any political leadership to actually be ahead of the curve uh, as far as national security is concerned. Uh, so unless you have actually systems in place which work according to well-set protocols, it is almost impossible to really do a good job of national security. And I give you the example of uh, you know, the Bombay uh, you know, terrorist attack. And uh, we saw how uncoordinated uh, you know, the response to that crisis uh, was. That even the crisis management system which had been in place, the drills which were in place, in fact, did not work. Because they were not allowed uh, to work. For example, there is a crisis management group under the uh, cabinet secretary. He does not need anybody's a permission, anybody's sanction to actually convene the crisis management group if any kind of a crisis emerges. And the advantage is that he's able to convene every major stakeholder in the governmental system uh, to deal with a, a crisis and remain in place while that crisis is unfolding in all its different manifestations. We have had example where it has worked and we have had examples where it Actually, it has not worked. You know, a simple thing like where uh, uh, the site of a crisis, how it must be cordoned off, how you must keep, you know, uh, for example, uh, media away from it, but at the same time, you must keep, you know, briefing the media all the time as to what is happening. Uh, those kind of systems broke down. So I think it is, it is extremely important that uh, uh, not only this aspect of you know, keeping all options open, but also treating each crisis as something like a new phenomena, which has to be dealt with a new set of uh, you know, ad hoc uh, measures. I think that's uh, something which uh, perhaps uh, we uh, need to look at. Um, many of you have already, uh, I hope, read the book, or at least uh, flipped through the book. Uh, and we have now had... Uh, an excellent introduction by Mr. Vora himself, and uh, as I said, uh, it's from somebody with uh, immense experience of national security, Shiv Shankar Menon, who has given us a, a, a very, very, very cogent view of what the challenges are and how we deal with them. Uh, so uh, we have about 10 to 15 minutes. If anyone you would like to ask a question, please uh, state who you are and also who you would like the question to be uh, answered by. And uh, Shankar, what I would propose to do is maybe have two or three questions together, and then perhaps you can respond, or Mr. Vora can respond. Uh, yes, please. Please. There's a mic. A short question, please, and a question, not a comment. My question yeah. is to Mr. N. N. Vora. Ora sir, have you seen the L.P. Singh committee report and the Manmohan Singh report? There are two reports on internal security, major, major reports. That has not been discussed at all. And as far as external security is concerned, China is the most important external security problem for India. I have not come across. I have, after retirement, I have written and gone to, chi gone to China and also meet a number of experts on China in different parts of the world, including UK. And I met Mr. Neville Maxwell for one yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. So can you what, no, ask, ask your question, is, please? My point is we have to pay very serious attention to national security, which has not been done so far. 
I think that is the that is the theme which my already is Mr. All right, please. Mr. Vora, Mr. Vora, sir, have you read the LPL Peace Committee? Okay, you have asked your question. Please, please sit down. Yeah. My name is GB. Please wait until you are called. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. I thought I'll come to you. May I? Go ahead. Yeah, my name is GB Bagai. I just have two points. One is that our policy in the case of Ukraine and in Israel is it just nuanced or can you call it morally indefensible in both cases? And number two, as far as China goes, uh, considering that for the last 55 years or so they have not fired a single shot over the border, therefore we should treat that threat, which is their potential of course, with uh, proper defense capability but certainly through economic uh, means, not okay. through war. Okay. So, Ashni. Thank you. I'm so Sohasini, Heather. I won't get up because I'm too far. Um, I, I, I actually can't choose between all three who should answer the question, but I think all three of you may have uh, a good perspective on this. Uh, in recent weeks in Israel, we have revisited many of us, uh, 2611 that you just spoke about. Do you think watching Israel's reaction of a sustained bombardment of the general area where they think the threat comes from uh, should make us rethink what we did after 2611? Um, uh, because there was always the question then too, should India have carried out a sustained bombing or not? Uh, or any kind of bombardment? Or d in hindsight, do you think actually uh, India's uh, reaction uh, created a certain deterrence. Uh, I'd, I'd love to know what you think. Okay. Would you like to? Yeah. <laughs> First you and then I'll ask. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, backwards, I mean, starting with Israel. Uh, on 26-11, I've written publicly said my first reaction was we should react militarily and overtly but that in hindsight for that time at that particular moment I think it was right but that I said even before you know 2016 I said that we probably won't react the same way in the future my own sense is that there's no general rule of how you can, each case is different, it has a different background, it has a different motivation. I don't think you can say there is one way of responding to all th terrorist threats. If there are general rules, they are very general, that you can't have, there's no military solution to ter terrorist threats. Terrorism is a political act. It's, it depends on the cooperation of the victim, by the way, in spreading the word and making sure that everybody gets terrorized. So in many ways, the response has to be both military and political, but the precise mix, how much bombing, what, where, that varies from case to case. Clearly what is happening now in Gaza, I mean, this is collective punishment for people, to, to move a million people. This is not, as far as I can see, it doesn't accord with either producing good outcomes, so efficacy, or with the normal humanitarian laws which apply in wars as well about not attacking civilian populations. So for me, this is actually a failure of, and it's not just since 7th October, it's a failure of relying, as a consequence of relying purely on military means uh, to try and solve and to try and ignore what is primarily a political problem here. And, I mean, that's the way I see it. But to answer your question, no, I, I really think the precise mix of means depends on the situation on the case and is case-specific. Uh, about dealing with China economically, uh, it's not quite accurate to say that no shots have been fired in 50 years. I mean, in 2020, shots were fired. Uh, apart from what happened in Galwa and in other places. So, I mean, that's not quite true. Um, but uh, if you think that by doing, I think the whole purpose of China policy, of all policy, is to create outcomes, right? It's not about glory, about status, about being right, wrong, this, that. It's about creating outcomes. 
if you are convinced that purely economic means can create the outcomes you want, a peaceful border, peaceful periphery, a change in China's objectionable behavior which you see around you, then fine, go ahead and do it. I am not so sure, and I think you'll get a lot of arguments when I look around at this audience of people who know these issues much better than I do. They, I'm sure you'll get a lot of pushback to that idea that you can deal with them purely economically. Uh, whether our policy on Ukraine, Israel is nuanced or morally indefensible, you have to choose. Do you want policy which works, or do you want policy which is moral and makes you feel good about yourself? It's up to you. I mean, frankly, I think consistently governments of India since independence have chosen policy that works. We have consistently been accused of not pulling our weight, of, being, of not having followed our models, of not having been true to our stated principles, etc. But every government of any political color has consistently chosen a realistic approach so that they can create outcomes that work. And so I think for me, that's what we are doing again. I see continuity here. Sir, you would like to make any comment? Yeah. Okay, General Mehta. Uh, thank you very much. I am a, uh, I'm a practitioner, a former practitioner. And we have uh, three former bureaucrats on this stage, uh, the, the consensus that has arrived, each one of them has said to us that what is lacking in our national security policy strategy is political decision making. In other words, strategic political guidance, right? So there's no doubt on that. Each one of the three has very rightly pointed out that they made four attempts to write a national security, or three. Uh, Mr. Sham Saran's might have been, oh, inclusive, whatever. Very laudable. So what is puzzling is that how come as national security advisors, or uh, former defense secretaries, that we were unable to convince the politicians or the political class that this is necessary, this is imperative. Now, let me go a little further. Uh, short because piece. I'm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm asking a question relevant to the theme, not Ukraine. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the question then, what happens is that the political class very cleverly and deftly transfers the responsibility to the military. So what happens? The defense minister doesn't write a, a directive for the armed forces. The armed forces write it and he signs it, right? So I think a time has come where the political class has to be convinced and the bureaucracy, the military and political, uh, uh, the, the foreign service, the civil service, have to convince the, 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 uh, the, politi the political class that you have to decide otherwise there will be no decision making. Okay, I think you have made your point. Uh, yes, please, right there. Short question, please. Very short question. Two questions, though. Uh, the first one is, should we not explicitly recognize the instrumental nature of national security, human rights being first in order of priorities? Because there is a very often national security is used as an alibi for suspending human rights. Okay. That is the first question. The other is that vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, we have uh, an unsettled border. They have six times our uh, GDP. 
we are not in a position to deter them. So Mr. Menon rightly pointed out that this needs to be looked into also. Okay. Saurabh. Brief, please. Thank you very much. It is very difficult, uh, such a thought-provoking thing. Very difficult to be brief, but I will try because the background sets the question. But you have all touched upon. I want to ask, uh, so skipping the background. The question of conceptualization of national security, is that a particular weakness? We are talking of operational things. But to un deterrence, you mentioned, but deterrence is in the mind of the deterree. And therefore, the reading of the mind. And therefore, for example, 2020. I don't know about within government, but one can safely say from the discourse, the country was at sea trying to understand what are the Chinese up to. And that determines your response. Okay. So the weakness in this, so the structural part you all touched upon, whether a structure which can, I think there is a case for the reverse, the political leadership is not running away, but possibly lacking in options, if you ask them to be fair, not enough options of an integrated nature. We are still very heavily, we talk about non-military threats to security, but we are still very heavily military because as Ms. Menon mentioned, the central security task is to protect your environment, uh, uh, economic development plans from threats. That needs conceptualization. What can be the threats? Okay. COVID, so, again, another, just an example. Post-COVID, uh, we I have think, not you know, set We are absolutely running out of time. We don't have time for comments. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay, one more question, please. Yeah. And only one more round after this, please. Uh, my question is that, um, actually, I want to state a little bit of um, numbers here and then jump to the question. Uh, the first number is that in about uh, 10 days, um, we will be culminating with about six months of civil war in Manipur. And nobody is bothered to even talk about it. Um, I want to give you some numbers, 200 dead, 3,000 injured, 65,000 plus displayed, displaced, living as refugees in their own state and country. Uh, they've been ga rape, gang rape, a beheading, women and seven-year-old child were burnt alive, uh, 200 plus villages, 300 plus churches, 100 plus temples have been destroyed. I'm coming to the question, please. Weapons. This is where I say that what we are looking at is a COVID 3.0 or a uh, Israel-Palestine situation right here in the country because 5,600 plus guns which include AK-47s, machine guns, carbines, 14,500 plus bombs and 6.5 lakh plus know, bullets come have to, been... I I'm think most of us know those figures. Please come to the question. Uh, I'm just coming there. Uh, all this has been stolen and my first question was where was the government machinery because as per uh, generals, Army generals, this was done because of state complicity. A person like me, a civilian, had to step in, go to the Supreme Court, and file an application about the weapons loot. And only after that application was filed, that four months of weapons looting came to an end. That first question, what was the entire machinery doing? Uh, what was the judiciary doing? What was the judiciary's role in an incident like this, that a civilian had to step in after four months my last question, and I want a very, very categoric answer. Who all, who all should be held accountable, responsible, arrested? Okay. All yours. You have to ask government where government was. <laughs> None of us, we're all expired bureaucrats. <laughs> so there's no point asking us this question. You made your point. And I think you probably have a lot of people here agreeing with what you said about how serious it is and how actually this is unconscionable, what we see happening in Manipur. But I think what, what we were trying to do earlier was, and this, this is why I said the next job is to do internal security, to do for internal security what this book does for national security, for the national defense, actually. Uh, but, uh, you know, in fact, that's why I also said, today we've got to the stage where you can't draw this distinction between internal and external anymore. It's become completely porous, and it actually affects your ability to defend India. 
And it's not only in the northeast or in the east, it's also in the north. It's, 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 and the, if there are real threats to Indian security, they're internal today, in my opinion. But that's a, about the conceptualization of national security. Yes, that is something that, but that's why we need a national security document, something which can at least everyone can engage with and argue about what security are we talking about. Because it's very easy to have such an expansive definition of security that everything is, is covered and that you then actually militarize everything. In fact, to some extent, this has happened to some of the great powers. You've seen the militarization of American foreign policy. You've seen the same thing happening to China as she gains power over the last 15 years. You've seen the role of the PLA increase in, in making policy. Now, is that where you want to go? Is that where, and that's why I raise the question of when you talk of total war, of all of society being involved, are you going to be Sparta? Is this where you want to go? You have, there are fundamental issues of conceptualizing national security here. And these are not easy choices. They're not simple choices that, you know, I can stand here and give you, here's the answer, or any of us. It's something that we have to do as a nation together and find a way of doing it. And that's where a policy is useful. At least it provokes a discussion, a debate among ourselves. Uh, on human rights versus national security, I mean, that depends on your definition of national security. I don't see why these are necessarily in opposition. They shouldn't be. Uh, and in fact, how can you talk of security if you don't have rights? <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me, at least. But you know, you're right. In the public mind, frankly, we've set these up as opposites. And very often in practice, that's what the citizen feels, that security is used as an excuse to infringe on their rights. But these are all the issues that I think, next volume, yes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, young man there. General Mehta's question. Yes, actually, we have to. He answered his own question, actually. You know, to say that this is essential, we should persuade them at a normative level, we'll all agree. Yes, yes, it's desirable, we should. I think we need to look into the reasons why it hasn't happened. Why hasn't it happened so far? Not for lack of effort, not for lack of goodwill. And then I think we need to address it. And this is why I think a beginning would be a white paper on defense. That in itself would at least start a process and make people more comfortable with the idea of a national security strategy or policy. Uh, but. Uh, but I think unless you go back, there's no point saying, oh, we failed, we have to now, we have to persuade them. Yes, we have to persuade them, but we haven't so far. All these, and by some really good attempts, I mean, the 2015 attempt was really good, having seen it before it was finalized. But, so, I... Okay. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Shraz and I have a two-part Short question, question because yes. we've run out of time. <laughs> Absolutely. So my first question is to uh, Ambassador Menon regarding uh, in <coughs> recent era with the advent of technology, would you consider uh, targeted misinformation as a huge issue in regards to Indian national security? And to uh, Vorosa, the question is regarding um, do you see that the Indian government can step up in regards to legislation to tackle security challenges, specifically with the recent revamping of the criminal laws that is going to come up in the upcoming winter session? That's it. Okay. This side. I forget. What's I, I didn't get that we sound. didn't get the second question. The can second you repeat question? that? The second uh, question both. Uh, the revamping of the criminal uh, laws. Can you give him a, yeah. a mic, please? <laughs> Am I audible now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in light of the recent revamping of the criminal laws of a country, do you believe that the government can actually make some effort to address this uh, center state issues of national security? And if so, what could they kind of implement via the same? Yeah, I'm Pradeep Gupta, a founder of uh, Think Tank Security and Policy Initiatives, working in Defense TOT. 
Uh, one uh, thing which I have observed in such uh, dialogues that the military industrial complex is not given the proper place. So I hope that in the next uh, publication, you will focus on also on the military in building uh, military industrial complex because that is a weak chain and our entire uh, security architecture in this country. You mean defense production in uh, indigenous production? Yes, defense production, production but there are more to, to more it to also, sir. Okay. Lot of uh, to defense R and D, finance, okay. everything. Okay. Only one last question, please. Sorry, uh, sir. Hijack. I just wanted to know. You know, our uh, neighbor, uh, without taking names. Uh, okay, I can say China specifically has been working on. You know, our Himalayan neighbors, be it Nepal as well as recently you seen Bhutan trying to resolve certain crises. How serious is that a threat? especially in the context of this continuing, uh, you know, LSE that we have with the, uh, you know, uh, Imbralgo that continues today. Okay. You want to criminalize? Uh, sir, last question you told me. No last question, please. Uh, <laughs> we, are, we are just completely out All of right. time. Uh, this uh, observation made just now about criminalization of the revamping of the criminal legal system of the country. Well, it's a, it's a pertinent observation. It's the entire criminal justice system determines the maintenance of law and order in the country. If the system fails, there is no law and order. Now, as you must have known for yourself, newspapers reporting 5 crore, 50 million <coughs> cases pending in the courts, um, accuse witnesses dying before they come up for hearing. So the situation is quite uh, uh, unsatisfactory, if I may say so. Um, regarding revamping of laws, recently some amendments have been made to the Indian Penal Court, the Evidence Act, and the Court of Criminal Procedure. I have no specialized knowledge of the changes made and whether they cover all the things that we have in mind. But uh, I, I do agree with you that a lot of work needs to be done. Regarding center state issues of national security, they can't be covered by laws. I think in our federal system, you need to have understandings, and understandings are sometimes uh, more viable than legal arrangements. We've seen legal arrangements also go wrong and uh, flouted, as we've seen the uh, river water issue in uh, northern India. States who are signatories to legal agreements, they just don't bother to uh, reply to the courts even. Mm, final on, on targeted misinformation, you know, deception has been a part of war forever. I mean, and it's part of national security strategy forever also. I mean, this is not, it's just that now the means have multiplied. And I think we are also in some ways besotted by technology. We actually believe that technology is going to guide our lives and, you know, <coughs> We've let our mental defenses down in some ways. If you rely too much on technology, yes, you will be fooled. Technology will be used to fool you. But, but this, is, this is a choice that you have to make. I mean, it's a question of how, how hard-headed you are. So I'm less worried about, you know, yes, there'll be new means, but you, you have to find new ways of countering that. And that's, that's, I think, doable. About China working on our Himalayan neighbors, you have no exclusive right over your neighborhood. You never have. The, if you are worried about other people in your neighborhood, then the answer is for you to make yourself indispensable, right? To their prosperity, to their security, to their future, and make yourself uh, somebody that they see as being a positive force for good in their lives. You've, you did a lot of that successfully with Bangladesh over the last few years. And you've seen the transformation in, in the relationship. You dealt with the security issues first, and then you built on that to build to, by doing power, etc. And now you, you, you actually see prosperity as a result of that. That's the only way to deal with this. If you start playing man-to-man -man marking with China or with anybody else, frankly, it's you've lost the game already. You need to follow your interests as India and make sure that your red lines are respected and you have enough means to do this. You know, I've, I don't know why we, 
sometimes behave as though we're a tiny little country that is threatened by small neighbors. I mean, this is no way to look at your neighborhood. For me, this is not an insoluble problem. And if they can get Chinese money and build things which we can use, I'm very happy if they do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. On that uh, note, uh, let me uh, call an end uh, to this session uh, by inviting uh, the, our director, uh, Sri Ken Shvastav, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you very much. None of these documents are in the public domain. No. In fact, we had said to the Dignitaries on the dais, ladies and gentlemen, uh, yeah. it's my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, as you all know, Sri Anand Bora has spent a considerable part of uh, his civil service life in uh, security-related uh, departments and ministries, be it in his capacity as a home secretary post uh, Blue Star Operations in Punjab as uh, Home Secretary of Punjab. Thereafter, a long stint uh, in the Ministry of uh, Defense, almost nine years, additional secretary and Defense, Defense Secretary, then Home Secretary, and later on as Governor of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, when he was uh, uh, President uh, uh, during the COVID period, uh, we were just discussing as to how we should uh, keep our programs going. Uh, he mentioned to us, and rather he has been mentioning quite often, that uh, national uh, uh, defense uh, uh, is something very important, national defense security aspect we must discuss and deliberate. So we decided to uh, have uh, a kind of discussion, but because of the COVID period, we could not arrange a physical you know, I mean, uh, discussion, so therefore we took uh, route to webinar. Uh, that webinar was you know, guided by Mr. Vora. And uh, finally, the product of that webinar is this uh, book, which has been released today. In this book, uh, basically, the necessity of having a national security policy has been very really clearly brought out. And also, the book delineates uh, the challenges which the national security is, uh, you know, faces today. Uh, on this occasion, uh, I would like to profusely thank uh, Mr. Vora for his indulgence in uh, conducting this uh, webinar and also helping us in bringing out this uh, volume. I must uh, mention here that uh, for this volume, Mr. Vora has uh, spent considerable amount of time uh, you know, to edit it so meticulously, so diligently, and so pernistically. And in the, we and uh, Omita are uh, you know, <laughs> a witness to the kind of effort that Mr. Vora has uh, put in. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Uh, Shiv Shankar Menon, our former uh, NSA and uh, Defense uh, uh, Foreign Secretary. Uh, he has vast experience in the field of uh, handling the uh, security matters. Uh, he very critically analyzed this book, and uh, he has uh, regarded his appreciation for the issues raised in this book. I thank you very much, sir, on behalf of IIC and on behalf of each one of us here for uh, taking out your time and being with us uh, today. I would also like to thank our uh, president, uh, Ambassador Shamsaran, who has always been guiding us, and he has conducted the proceedings uh, very nicely. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank all of you for your gracious presence, and I'm sure that uh, the book, uh, the issue that this book has raised, all of us will be deliberating over it, and there'll be more occasions at the IIC to uh, you know, have you know, discussions on uh, security-related matters. And I'm hopeful that uh, based on the effort that we have put in and the issues that we brought out, perhaps the policy makers would also take note of uh, the urgent necessity of bringing out a national security policy, because this policy only is going to really determine the roles to be played by various stakeholders in uh, maintaining our national security. So with these few words, I thank you all of, uh, thank all of you once again for your presence and your Thank you very much.